first of all, just uh, getting back on a couple of questions from uh, the class yesterday. Uh, somebody asked, I think it was, was it you? About uh, why the temperature is increasing again in the mesosphere. Uh, so the reason, so what we talked about yesterday was what determines the, the, the what is called the lapse rate or the temperature profile of the troposphere is this, uh, that pressure is decreasing with height. Uh, so as air moves up, it expands and cools down. Uh, but that also releases uh, water uh, drops, uh, so condensing water, which releases heat. And the net effect of this is this lapse rate of 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer going up. But then in the troposphere you have, or the stratosphere, you have a different uh, mechanism. And that, that is the, the absorption of this really short wave uh, uh, ultraviolet radiation, and especially at the top. Uh, and what that means is also that here you have cooler air at the bottom and, and, and hotter air uh, at the top, which means that this is very stable. The air doesn't move very much up and down. Because here you have air that is warmer in the, in the bottom, so that will tend to rise. And so when you get a circulation, whereas in the, in, in the stratosphere you don't have that. The cool air here will not rise because the air above is, is, is warmer. So you get something that's very stable here, which means that you have, uh, yeah, not men, you don't have see formation of clouds in the same way in the stratosphere, for example. Then what happens in the, in the mesosphere is, is you have uh, more or less the same uh, processes that work again. So as you move up, uh, pressure, pressure decreases with height. Uh, I, can, I guess that one reason is that you, you, it's more steep curve here, is you don't have very much water vapor. So you don't, you don't have this counteracting effect of, of uh, uh, condensing water uh, that you have in the troposphere. Uh, so I think, and, and another reason that the pressure here is so low, so I guess uh, less, and this is, this is m partly me speculating, but the reason that you see the, the absorption of, of the shortwave radiation here in, this, it's in the stratosphere is you have enough, the pressure is high enough, so you have gases that actually, you have enough molecules that absorb this incoming radiation. Where here the pressure is starting to get low, so low, so it's, it's uh, much less uh, chance of that happening. So I think that's, so the process is here in the mesosphere is the same as in the, in, in the troposphere. Then Thomas, you had a question about the temperature when we talked about the temperature in the simple model, and we have one temperature. Whereas in reality, on Earth, you of course have different temperatures at different parts of the atmosphere, as you see here, and different parts of, of the Earth, and so on. Uh, and I give it some thought, and I think, I mean, the basic reply is that it, what the temperature we use in this very simple model is sort of a, an average um, radiation temperature, <laughs> the effective radiation temperature of, of, of the Earth which is some, then something different than this when we talk in, in daily life about the average temperature of Earth, because that's sort of an arithmetic average. You should really take uh, the average of, of the T to the 4. Exactly, 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 yeah. exactly. So they will differ somewhat, yeah. So that's a good point. Uh, okay. Um, then for today, So yesterday we, we derived this expression of the greenhouse effect that tells us that, that the strength of the natural greenhouse effect depends on the emissivity of the atmosphere and the temperature difference between the surface of the Earth and, and the atmospheric layer, or this temperature gradient in, in, uh, in the atmosphere. And then we talked about what the reasons for having this temperature gradient. So what we'll talk about today mainly relates to this the emissivity of the atmosphere. So what de determines the emissivity of the atmosphere? Um, so the aim of this lecture is to be able to understand what's the effect of increasing greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere is on the radiative balance of, of Earth, uh, of, of the atmosphere. Uh, we'll talk about a concept that's very central to, to uh, anthropogenic climate change, which is radiative forcing, which is a measure uh, of to which extent we disturb this natural greenhouse effect uh, by emitting greenhouse gases, for example. Um, and then we'll talk briefly about something called global warming potential, which, which is a way to try to compare emissions of different greenhouse gases that vary both in strength and, both in, and, and in lifetime in the atmosphere. Uh, so we have a, uh, a sense for that. 
And we'll also go through the last of the calculation exercises for this week. So first of all, so looking at what determines the, 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 the emissivity of the, of the atmosphere, uh, its ability to, to absorb and emit uh, primarily infrared radiation. Um, so this graph shows what happens uh, with radiation as it goes through the atmosphere. From the, all the way from the radiation that we receive from the sun. So this is the uh, radiation diagram for black body, uh, 6,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, which is roughly the temperature as, as you've seen from uh, the surface of the sun. And here you have uh, black body radiation from, from a body that has minus 18 degrees Celsius temperature, which is then the sort of effective radiation temperature of Earth. If you look at Earth from, the, from, from the space, this is how cold it looks or how warm it looks. So starting from this, from the very, uh, <coughs> very far end here, so here you have the, the ultraviolet radiation. And on this scale, you have how much of that radiation is absorbed in as you move through the atmosphere. So you see that, that nearly 100% or 100% of the, the, the short wave, really short wave radiation in the atmosphere is absorbed. And that happens in, in, the, the, in the stratosphere, in the highest layer of the atmosphere. And you also see here the compounds that are responsible for that absorption. And you see that, well, we generally talk about uh, the ozone and how important that is for absorbing the, the incoming ultraviolet radiation, which is sort of that. The ultraviolet is that, here is the, the visible part of the spectrum. So ultraviolet is this, that is sort of near, the, uh, near the, the visible spectrum. So that is ozone. But for the very high level, uh, high energy radiation here, it's mainly actually uh, oxygen that absorbs that. And what that does, it, it splits the oxygen atom, or molecules into two oxygen atoms that then combine with oxygen molecules to form ozone. So that's what happened here. And then you see an area here, the visible spectra, where n nearly all of the radiation from the sun just passes through the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is, is more or less uh, transparent to visible radiation, and that's why that's why we see it. Right? That's why our uh, eyes are adjusted to to picking up that light. Okay, and then if we look at the then on the other side of the spectrum here, the, the infrared radiation uh, that uh, is emitted from Earth uh, from the surface at this temperature, uh, you see that there. Much of that radiation, the really long wave radiation, is absorbed, most of it, and mostly by uh, water vapor. Uh, and here you also, in this area, you also have uh, quite high absorption. Uh, but then you have an area here where you, which you usually call the, the atmospheric window, where actually quite a large fraction of the outgoing infrared radiation escapes directly into space. And that's what we had in our, our simple model as well yesterday that a share of, of this outgoing radiation actually ex escapes into space. Uh, but a large share is, is, is captured in the atmosphere. Yeah? So the, the alpha, the albedo, is something else. Uh, so that has, the albedo does not have to do with absorption of the incoming solar radiation, but that is reflection. So that's, so that's another process. So it's just reflected, it's not absorbed, it's just reflected, it's like a mirror. Uh, so, so this here actually is absorbed and heats the Earth, and is transferred to, to sort of heat energy in, in, in the molecules, in the atmosphere, and, in, uh, uh, and, and, on, and on the surface, and so on. What is reflected just bounces off and, and disappears, and does not transfer any energy to, uh, to, to the Earth. So that is not included here. Was that? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Good. Any more questions about this? Is the most common gas is not there, nitrogen. Like does it yeah. not react? Does it not get excited by any? No. <laughs> so, 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 well, it's a good point. So, nitrogen and oxygen, which constitutes like 99% uh, of, of the atmosphere, uh, 
doesn't react or, or is, does not absorb neither the, the, the long wave radiation, visible radiation, or any of this. And why is that? Well, the reason is, so what does, what, what needs to happen for, so, so you remember the, what the light the radiation is. It, it's an electromagnetic radiation. So, it's, it's a, so in order for it to absorb, be absorbed, you must have some sort of shift in asymmetry in electric, um, what do you call it? Ladning. Uh, potential. Potential, yeah. So, and, and, and the thing with both oxygen and, uh, and, and nitrogen is that they are completely sym symmetrical. So it's two oxygen atoms that sit together, or two nitrogen atoms. So you don't have any asymmetry in the... What about this, the this way? What's it called? Something yeah, if the virus. But it's still symmetrical. It's totally symmetrical. So, uh, so, that's, so you don't get that, what you call a, a dipole, a slight shift in the electric, uh, I'm missing the word, what's lobning him? Uh, charge. Charge, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, whereas, if you look at the uh, carbon dioxide, you have a C here and you have oxide, and, and it, it looks more like this. And you actually have sort of, the, so the electrons in, that are shared, ele electrons in some sense are closer to uh, I can't remember if it's, it's the carbon or the oxygen, but, but you get, as this starts to uh, vibrate and so on, you get a shift in the electric charge, where it's, it's sort of uh, center of gravity in a sense. And it's that shift that then can be picked up or induced by this electromagnetic radiation. So that's a really good, good question. So you need some sort of asymmetry for that to happen in the charge in, in these molecules. Exactly. Um, let's see if you have. Oh, you don't have the book. Uh, but if you. Yeah, once you get the book, or once you have the, the PDF in front of you, the, the you have a picture here of, of the, some different molecules and the fact that. So you have this. Ox carbon dioxide molecule, which is symmetric, isometrical, which implies that you can get the shift in, in where the charge, you have a sort of a, a, a charge difference between the carbon and the oxygen here. Yeah. So we, we can look at this. Oh, yeah. So if we're looking at the natural greenhouse effect, most of that is due to the existence or the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere. So about 60%, something like that, of the natural greenhouse effect is due to the presence of, of, of water vapor. Uh, about 26% is due to carbon dioxide. Uh, a little less, 8% or less, is due to ozone. And then methane and nitrous oxide, uh, the remaining 6%. So the main two natural greenhouse gases is water vapor and carbon dioxide. They account for most of the absorption of this long wave outgoing infrared radiation in the atmosphere. So we're going to look at this uh, in a different picture. So, so this is this picture is just this uh, part of this picture, and sort of inverting this. So we're now we're looking at. Uh, the infrared spectrum, and you see, and this, the jagged line here is the infrared radiation you would see if you look at the Earth from, from space. So measured from a satellite at the, uh, at, at the top of the atmosphere, for example. Um, so, and, and that is shown in comparison to these smooth lines here are the black, what would, the radiation that will come from a black body at different temperatures. So the dotted line here, the lowest one, is from a black body with a temperature of 220 kelvins. And up here we have, uh, yeah, 300 kelvins here. So the blue line here is the temperature at the tropopause, the, the, uh, the boundary layer between the troposphere and the stratosphere, which is pretty much the, the coldest, it, as cold as it gets in the atmosphere. And the red line here is roughly the temperature of the surface of the Earth. 
So by looking at this, you can actually see where the radiation comes from. So you see for carbon dioxide here, that radiation actually, the infrared radiation <coughs> that is due to, to comes from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere actually comes from sort of the top of the atmosphere. And then you have this again, this is the now this atmospheric window where the radiation that, that escapes into space comes from a temperature that is the temperature of the surface. So that has not been absorbed uh, in the mean going from the, from, from the, the surface up, up, uh, out into space. And then see here you see it, it's sort of it's in between some places. So, for carbon dioxide, you have this. So what, what, what happens is you, you, you get this bending of, of this molecule. Uh, and that sort of, that bending, that vibration is induced by infrared radiation with this wave number. Wave number was uh, <coughs> the, the, the number of oscillations per centimeter you measure it is. So it's... Uh, we go back to the other, you actually here you have the wavelength and the wave number. So the shorter the wavelength, the more oscillations per centimeter. So it's, you can think of this, quite commonly in, 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 in this area, you use the wave number instead of the wavelength, which is sort of not as intuitive. But, so this is the number of oscillations per centimeter you get. So it's the inverse of, of the wavelength. So the, the higher the wave number, the, uh, the shorter the wavelength. Okay? Questions about this? Does this? Um, so the frequency measures uh, oscillations per second. So, but, but since the, the speed of light is constant, yeah, then, then in a sense the wave number says the same thing. It's, but it's oscillation per, per centimeter. It's just to get a number that's easier to remember in a sense. Because you can't. Okay, uh, that's good. So this is, so clouds. No, it also affects. So, so clouds are also very good at absorbing infrared radiation because it's, it's, uh, it's water vapor. So on average, even though, I mean, so on, on, on average in the, in the atmosphere, water vapor, the concentration is not very, very high. But in, in clouds, you get, of course, that's you get saturated. Uh, so that's why you'll get a different picture if you would have clouds in here. Then, then much more would be absorbed by um, by the clouds, by the water vapor in, the, in those clouds. And we'll talk, more, we'll talk more, more about that when we come to climate feedbacks, because one of the most important climate feedbacks there is, is how a warming of the earth affect the, the, the cloud formation. And as you say, Vivian, the, the clouds both affect the albedo mm -hmm. and the emissivity. So, and the relation between the two will depend on where the clouds are. So higher clouds and lower clouds will have different effects on the climate. So, but, but you will come, come back to that on Friday, I think. But it's a good question. So this is for sort of uh, without clouds. So, <clears throat> so you can talk about saturation areas in the spectrum where all of the the uh, the infrared radiation that is emitted from the surface is absorbed in the atmosphere and where do you think can you, do you have any clue of an area in the spectrum where that happens how would you know where that if that happens So if every, all the radiation that, that is emitted from the surface is absorbed, where would the radiation then come from that actually is emitted at, at what temperature? Uh, 
would, would the mission occur. So, so the Earth emits, and because the Earth emits, it's a perfect black body, so it, it, it emits in all these, uh, in, in all these frequencies. Uh, but then it's, it is absorbed and re-emitted. Uh, and for some places in the spectrum, all of the emissions that come from the, the surface is actually absorbed in the atmosphere. So we said here, where, where you actually see that the, the radiation sort of signature set tells you that this is the temperature of the surface, then nothing, nothing is absorbed. The opposite holds, for example, here, where the emission that actually, the, the radiation that you see comes from the temperature at the top of the atmosphere. So what you see here is what is emitted at the top of the atmosphere. Everything else has been absorbed between the surface and that. So if carbon dioxide is already absorbing all the outgoing infrared radiation, then what happens if you increase it even more? More? Yeah, well, if it already absorbs everything, then how can it absorb more? Yeah. Well, there's two things uh, happening here. But, w but one thing is, is abs it, it absorbs everything here in this, in this area. But let's look how it, how it looks. So this is, this is from a model that you're going to use in the lab tomorrow, where you can actually it models the, the outgoing infrared radiation uh, from the Earth. And you can play around with different levels of, of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and so on. And see how, how, how the absorption in the atmosphere uh, changes. So this is from the uh, uh, same picture again, but without any carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's the only difference. So if we increase this from zero to 10 parts per million, and remember, the, the prehistoric uh, concentration of, of carbon dioxide was about 280 ppm, uh, and now we're up at 390. So, as you introduce carbon dioxide, you see that you get this shift here. So it starts to absorb the outgoing radiation in this area. And the, it absorbs most in exactly this, this frequency here or this wave numbers, 667 uh, per centimeter. But you see also that it, it, it absorbs around it a bit. If you increase it to 100 ppm, well then you have saturated in this area, but you absorb a bit more in the areas around. And then if you increase it to 1000 ppm, you see that it broadens, so you get this broadening. So it still absorbs, but this, this area where it absorbs and it's saturated, it gets broadened. So remember the first day when I told you that molecules or uh, <coughs> atoms can only absorb in a certain wavelength, sort of. And it's only if that is that exact wavelength that, it, uh, that, that the radiation is absorbed. Well, I wasn't completely telling the truth. Uh, so what happens, there, and the reason is, there are, t there are two di reasons for this. So the, that vibration happens just, that vibrational energy is just for this 667 per centimeter wavelength. But there are two effects that imply that carbon dioxide can also absorb in areas around that. And one is called the, has to do with something called the Doppler effect. Has anybody heard about the Doppler effect? The Doppler effect is what makes the pitch of the siren increase as it's coming. Yeah, yeah exactly. And decrease as it's going away. But I have yeah. no idea how that <laughs> relates to this. <laughs> okay, that was not the, the. You don't have to answer that. Okay, so the basic Doppler effect is, for example, sound. Sound is also a wave. So if you have sound that's emitting for something that is moving towards you, the the frequency of that will appear as uh, it, it, it'll get the frequency will get, get higher, the wavelength will get shorter. So as, 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 as an ambulance is moving towards you, the pitch of the sound sounds uh, higher, the siren sounds higher. And as it's moving away from you, you have the opposite effect. It sounds uh, lower. 
So you get sort of the same thing here. So if you have uh, electromagnetic radiation that hits, uh, yeah, exactly, a molecule that is moving towards it, you you can actually then have uh, radiation with a slightly uh, lower, lower uh, wavelength, for example. The other effect is in as molecules interact here, so you, all the time you have molecules in this gas that, that bump each, against each other and transfer energy from each other. And what can actually happen is that there comes some radiation that is maybe, let's say that the wavelength is, is a bit too high. Uh, so it's not exactly the 667 uh, per, per centimeter wave, uh, wave number. It, it has some more energy, but then what can happen is actually that this, the, this carbon dioxide molecule absorbs this and then there's some X and, and creates this vibration, but there's some excess energy then and that is transferred to another atom or another uh, molecule that it hits at the same time. So it can sort of, these molecules act a, a, as one and transfer the energy bet between them. And the other way around that it can, the, the combination of this radiation that maybe has a little too little uh, uh, energy, but another molecule bumping into it at the same time um, means that it actually can absorb and emit also outside of this spe specific peak. But the likelihood of this ha happening is of course lower. And, and of course the further away you move, the, the less likely it is that you, know, you will hit another molecule that has enough energy for that to happen. So carbon dioxide is best at absorbing, emitting at this specific wavelength, but it can also sort of you get this broadening. Uh, so the more uh, the more you add of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the, the broader this absorption spectrum gets. This effect of this sharing of energy and so on is is precisely the reason why solid materials are close to to perfect black bodies. Because here the molecules are so tight, tightly attached to each other, so it's much easier to get this sharing of, of energy, which means that they can basically absorb and emit radiation in all wavelengths. So it's not sort of limited with, with just having this, oh, the specific vibration or rotational change. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so now we have basically, the, I mean, the basic building blocks to, to understand the natural greenhouse effect. So this is sort of a simple model that we, 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 uh, we constructed and derived this expression of what the greenhouse effect is. Uh, we've looked at this bit more complex picture uh, of how the radiation balance of, of, of the atmosphere actually looks. So you have incoming solar radiation. Uh, some of that gets reflected back into space, does not interact, uh, does not transfer energy at all. Uh, but the rest is absorbed uh, in the atmosphere and in, at the surface. Warms the surface, which then radiates out to, sp out to space. Some of that energy is released directly out to space through this atmospheric window where we don't have greenhouse gases uh, that are very good at emitting. I didn't say that, but, but so if you look at that, so the reason that some gases, and we'll see, you see this more, some gases are extremely potent greenhouse gases is precisely because they are very good at absorbing in this atmospheric window. So new trace compounds that are not present in, in sort of the uh, uh, the natural uh, greenhouse effects. So these CFCs and, and uh, hydrogenated compounds uh, are, are extremely good at, at absorbing here. And therefore they're also very strong greenhouse gases. So most of the emissions uh, are uh, radiation gets absorbed, radiated back and so on. So what I want you to do now is, is just pair up two and two, as you said, and Try to explain the natural greenhouse effect to each other. So 
using these concepts that we talked about. So infrared and visible radiation, absorption, uh, emission, atmospheric window, the temperature profile, which, which we talked about, which is essential as so. well. So, so try to put everything together in your head, explain it to somebody else, and see if, if you can do it. <laughs> and then we'll see what kind of question comes up. How, how did it feel? Yeah, I got a really good question here, which might help uh, sort of exp or to think about this, uh, because you asked. So, so what? So this the the radiation is absorbed here by carbon dioxide. What, so, what does that mean? What happens with the energy? Right. Um, so. Let's see if I, I can explain it uh, again in the same way as I managed, I hope. So, so this is, first note that this is watts per square meter and per wave number, per, per cycles per centimeter. So, so this is, and if you integrate it, the area under here is, is total energy, right? So the area under here is the total energy in, 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 in watts per square meter uh, from a black body that radiates at this temperature. And the area under here. Uh, so what happens with the, the infrared radiation, so if, if Earth is a perfect black body, so it radiates this amount of energy, the total area under the red curve here, right? That's how much energy it, it, it radiates out. But what is actually released into space is the area under this squiggly line here. So some of that energy that is radiated out from the surface of the Earth actually is absorbed and that energy is transferred to heat energy in the Earth atmosphere system. So in a sense, the greenhouse effect is the difference here between the area under the red line and the area under the squiggly line. So for carbon dioxide here, for example, all of this, if you look at this section just here, the amount of energy that is emitted from the surface here is, is, is the full, the integral in this area. But the amount that is released into space is just what is under this, this line here. And the difference is the energy that is sort of retained and heats the surface and the atmosphere. That is the green aspect. Can you talk about what happens to the molecules and what they do with the energy? Why it's 646? Um, so, so the reason it's, yeah, I didn't really talk about it, uh, and I don't, I'm not that good at the actual physics of this, but, but, so why, why it's exactly 667 per centimeter wave number that it uh, absorbs, I, I can't give a good answer, but it has to do with exactly how the, with the shape, of the, the shape of the molecule and, yeah. Something that sort of makes related to the, to the angle and the distance between the, the, the C and the O and mm -hmm. makes them sort of vibrate. And I think they can vibrate in different ways and there's, yeah. they can kind of, that's what I was Yeah, saying. that was the and dance, they, yeah, yeah. Or they can also do this, the distance yeah. between the C and the O can go. Yeah, 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 like that, yeah. Going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but, but one thing is that once you sort of change the vibrational state here, that so, so if we remember the first, uh, like for visible light, where you have this, you, you push an electron out to a higher orbit, what usually happens is that it bounces down again, like within really, really short time spans. Uh, so you absorb it and then it gets re-emitted. But this change in vibrational state is actually, uh, in this area, quite stable, which means that it can pers persist for sort of milliseconds or even seconds. And within that time, it's more likely that that molecule will collide with another molecule and transfer that energy as kinetic energy, i.e. temperature. So that's why the absorption uh, of, of uh, uh, if, if it was just re-emitted again, it wouldn't have the same effect. But it's actually transferring this radiation energy to changes in vib vibrational energy that then changes the temperature and is sort of dispersed uh, throughout other molecules. 